Hi, this is Bruce Buffer, your voice of the Oxygen, and you're listening to MMA Mental. Welcome to this week's MMA Mental Podcast. My name is Ray. As always, the MMA Mental Podcast is sponsored by UK Fightwear. You can follow them on Twitter at UKFW and also the UFC Live Facebook page, which you can like on Facebook. Also, check out our follow pod- fellow podcast, the MMA Podcast, hosted by Jake, and the Word on the Street, hosted by Ramses, two of our uh, two very good friends of the show, so definitely check them out. And also, check out the following Facebook pages, MMAMental.com and UFC Games. Also, want to thank the people that helped me get ready for my fight at Cage Fighter Leeds in March against Almighty Fightwear's Stephen Mayer. Uh, we're both raising money for charity. Uh, Stephen's raising money for the Martins House, and I'm raising money for British Long Fund- Foundation. So, just want to thank out. There's two people that are helping me get ready for this fight. Uh, they're de- donating their time uh, to me. So that's for sh- that's Sean Flynn uh, and Matty Evans. Uh, Matty is based in Coventry and he's a personal trainer. So if anyone would like to help, would like help and advice in getting fit, eating properly, or learning any area of MMA, then you can contact Matty on 07899002091. Okay, I've got we've got three uh, guests up this week. Then uh, we start the show with the UK MMA with your MMA. Uh, we have Jay Furness giving us a quick roundup of all the big news on the UK scene, and also the UK fighters who are competing internationally. Uh, then we speak to Davy Grant as he breaks down the latest tough episode, which included him, him meeting Cain Velasquez uh, and Nate Diaz, and the fight between Michael Wooten and Chris Holdsworth. And then finally, we speak to Luke Barnett. Um, he, he talks to us about his huge victory over Andrew, Andrew Craig, who he would like to face next. And he also reveals that he is in talks with, uh, with talks to be an assistant coach on Tough Brazil. So hopefully, you enjoy these interviews. All right, guys, welcome to uh, week three of the UK MMA update with yourmma.tv. Um, and we're giving you a quick rundown of everything that's going on uh, on the domestic scene and with the domestic fighters. Um, so it's been a busy week for Cage Warriors. Um, a lot of announcements coming out and some big signings. Um, John Maguire signed to fight his, his first fight with Cage Warriors. Um, and that's a tough fight against Phil Morpeter. That's going to be New Year's Eve in uh, Dublin and Kurt Walburton joined uh, Cage Warriors as well and he's going to make his debut against uh, Wesley Merch in Newcastle at Cage Warriors 62 and both those cards are growing by the day so you've got to make sure that you keep your eyes on those cards at yourmma.tv forward slash events and they'll all be up there um, yeah so in other news this weekend we've had some uh, some guys out on Bellator um, Linton Vassell made his Bellator debut uh, on Friday night, uh, Bellator 107, uh, a dominant, dominant uh, unanimous decision victory for Linton. Um, a good way to break him into the Bellator ranks. Uh, um, it'll, we'll see if he'll get his way into the tournament with that win there. Um, on the same show, Martin Stapleton um, fought a very tough Derek Campos. Uh, that was, it was a tough back and forth fight. Unfortunately, Stapes lost the decision, but you know he was happy with his performance. It was a good fight. Um, he's now 0-2 with the promotion, but hopefully he'll be getting another shot because uh, it was part of a really good fight on Friday night and he's more than capable of hanging at that level. Uh, of course, we had Paul Daly out in Russia as well um, and he lost a decision to the pretty much unknown Alexander Yakolev. Um, that's a little bit of a setback for Daly, but he fights for the Bama title in December. So, yeah, I mean, he'll be looking to get back to winning ways on uh on December the 7th, I believe it is, in Birmingham. And um, Nico Joker was fighting in Finland at Cage. Huge show there, out in Turku. Um, and he fought a very good guy in, in Tippi Hervey Kingas. Um, unfortunately, lost via submission in the first round. But it was a big opportunity for him, and I'm sure a lot, lots more opportunities will come uh, because of that fight. Um, obviously, the other big news was uh, Alexander Gustafsson. Uh, Obviously, his opponent pulled out last week, but Jimmy Manoa will be the one to step in and take on uh, the Mauler at UFC in London in March. I mean, that's a huge fight for Jimmy. We've had a lot of discussion about this on the Your MMA Facebook page. Um, find us on there if you want to join in. Just type in Your MMA into your search bar. Um, but yeah, I mean, a lot of people have got very different opinions, but, you know, it's going to make for an interesting fight on the night, I'm sure. Um, and, you know, Jimmy's going to be really really wanting this fight you know he's got nothing to lose either so that makes him 
super dangerous. Um, we're expecting Brad Pickett's flyweight debut on that same show as well, so that's definitely one to keep an eye out for. Uh, the other big news really was uh, the retirement of Owen Roddy. I mean, Roddy was really a, an Irish MMA pioneer. Um, you know, he was doing the, the big fights and looking great on taking on international fighters before, you know, the, a lot of the current crop were even in the nappies, you know. So he, he's done a lot for the sport there. Uh, he retires with an 11-4 record and he goes out on the loss against Wilson Hayes in December. Um, but many people will remember that fight. Amazing fight. And, um, yeah, it's a shame to see him go just now when you, you think he might have some more in the tank. But, um, you know, we wish him all the best in the future. Coming up this weekend, I'm going to keep this brief here. Fight UK uh, down in Leicester. Uh, their, their main event is a flyweight title fight between uh, Meyer and Foster, two very good up-and-coming flyweights. And you've got the likes of Turner vs Flynn, Lenjoint vs Miller, and Pilot vs Sheridan on there. Uh, you've got Autumn Impact. Um, those guys, it, that's going to be topped by a middleweight title fight between Leighton Benskin and Tommy Cook. Uh, too much talent, that's going down. Um, I think that's sort of slow way. And you've got uh, the likes of Joe Lawrence versus Andy Young on there. Uh, Williams versus Kerr and you know some other good fights on. A uh, few other events around the country, Into the Cage, Total Combat. Um, you know, so if you're looking for some local MMA to support, then make sure you get down there and, and check those guys out. If you need any of the fight cards or the information, remember it's uh, yourmma.tv. You'll find us on there. Um, and if you need to keep up with any of the updates on the UK MMA scene, it's at yourmma on Twitter, Y O U R M M A, yourmma on Facebook, yourmma.tv, and you can follow me at jfurnacemma on Twitter. Until next week, guys, take it easy. Peace out. We're now joined by David Grant. David Grant is back with us again to break down the latest episode of the Ultimate Fighter Season 18, which is episode 10. Davey, thanks for coming back on the show to break down the episode. Yeah, hi, Ray. No problem, mate. Uh, it looks like it was uh, there were some uh, some real highlights. It looked like personal highlights for you uh, watching the show. So I wanted to ask you, what was the... Uh, we'll jump straight in. What was the Harley Davidson Motorcycle Boot Camp like? Oh, yeah, that was pretty cool. It was... It- yeah, it was nice to, to just get out of the house and break up the boredom a bit in there and get the light down, try some of the Harleys out and stuff. It was, it was, it was a really good day and it was like, uh, it was nice to see what you've got the got the chance to go and win. Are you much of a, a biker normally, or is it is, this is quite um, a new thing for you? Yeah, man. I mean, I used to I used to ride uh, motorbikes and stuff when I was when I was a young kid, but um, like I I haven't, I haven't rode one since I was like a teenager. I don't think I, I was really. I've never, I've never bothered passing my test or anything. It was just like around the fields on trials bikes when I was a young man. What? Uh, but, but they've always interested us. What did you think to the bikes in the in the shot in the the boot camp? Oh, they were cool as hell. They were really were. They were like they felt really powerful when you were on really comfortable rides. And it, it was good to get them going and get them going on like the the bike treadmill. What it was as well. It was, it was, it was, it was a good experience. Well, how much of a shock was it when uh, Cain Velasquez turned up? Yeah, it was, it was a bit of a shock. Actually, it was nice, nice to see him, you know. Um, yeah, it was good. It was good. Uh, we got to, got to take the speech from him for a bit afterwards as well. He's a really cool guy. I bet it was a bit surreal, wasn't it, when he just turned up on the bike? Yeah, he just sort of came strolling in. <laughs> it, was, it was good. It was a nice surprise. Okay, now, the other thing that jumped out this week, of course, was uh, was you got to train with someone uh, different, and it was someone that uh, we got, we got they gave us the impression that you were a big fan of, which was Nate Diaz. What was it like yeah. training with Nate? Oh, it was it was great, honest. I mean, uh, yeah, he's he's been one of my favourites for uh, um, just as long as I've been watching MMA, you know. Um, so to, so to get to meet him, it was, it was brilliant, honest. I was over the moon, and then actually to get a roll with him and stuff like that, well, honestly, it was it was great. He's definitely one of the most uh, exciting fighters I think in the UFC. He's very charismatic, isn't yeah. he? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I love his style and uh, his attitude, and he's, he's um, I, I just I just really like him in general. He's, he's really though looking at your style and his style not so much style of fighting but like the characteristics he's a complete opposite to you isn't he because you're very laid back where he's very much he's, ve- he's very aggressive isn't he yeah yeah I know but um, I, I don't know I think yeah, he's just real he's just he, he, he's, he, at the end of the day he's genuine you know what I mean there's no one yeah. that's coming from him and, and I feel as if I'm the same do you know what I mean maybe not the same type of people but we're both genuine and we just, uh, we just that's, that's how we are do you know what I mean 
Yeah. And, uh, uh, yeah, he just seems like a real genuine guy, and uh, he's not put up with the cameras or anything like that. Uh, and he just he, he does his own thing, and I respect that. Now, this week, of course, we kicked off the semis, uh, and your teammate and, of course, fellow, f- uh, fellow UK fighter Michael Wooten was fighting. And I know you've been yeah. helping him. You were helping each other a lot in the build-up to the fights. How did he seem in the build-up to the fight? Um, yeah, it, it, it was. Uh, um, it was. Um, it was a little bit tight. It was, you know, took me a lot more um, in the prelim fight. And um, yeah, it was. It was. Um, it was a good fight. I think he's trying to get his weight back down and stuff like that. He, I mean, he, he had a little bit of a few a bit bad food. Maybe just for a day after he fought, which which everyone's entitled to. Do you know what I mean? And he just he just had, he had a couple of days where he was there, but he just wasn't feeling on top of his game. It was just getting to him a bit. But to be honest, it was getting to everyone in the house. It was it was like it was well, the closer he got to the end, the further away it seemed. Sort of thing. It was weird. It was like uh, all all the um, everything sort of started to build up on you in the, in the last in the last week or so. It just got really really hard to take. And uh, yeah, it was tough. And uh, but we all found it tough as well. And uh, Mike, Mike had a bit had a bit of a hard time. So. It was just, Trying to, trying to be there for him as much as I could. Yeah, just a quick review now. At the time of the fight, he he, he definitely seems to be struggling when it comes to the fight. Uh, it's fair yeah. to say, Holdsworth dictated the pace of the fight uh, and he sunk yeah. in a rear naked choke after taking his back. How hard was it for you watching your friend lose like that? Yeah, I mean, I was, I was good as far as Obviously, I was, I was rooting for him all the way. Um, and uh, I, I think I think it's funny to get it would be a totally different outcome. I think Mike, Mike, was, Mike was just unlucky. He just got caught in the sub. You know, and I think uh, if he fought him again, it would be it would be totally different. Um, he maybe, uh, he, I mean, I don't think he don't think he fought to know any of his full potential in that fight. But just sometimes, sometimes happens. You know what I mean? I know he's a lot, of, he, he's a better fighter than that. Uh, and um, I was just so so good at fun. Yeah, I think fighting on the Ultimate Fighter with the way you have so many fights so close together, you don't really your body doesn't get a chance to recover. You don't have the downtime that you normally get after a fight. It's certainly yeah. a completely different environment to when you're fighting normally, isn't it? Yeah, definitely. And like, I like two, three round, two, three round fights in um, in, four, in four weeks. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? So you have to recover from them, and obviously he's had these had to do. There's that would be there's the third weight could he done, and he's a big one three five as well. Do you know what I mean? He's never, he's never had to cut that many times and that many weeks before. You know what I mean? And yeah, it must have been tough for him. Yeah. Now I know at that stage as well. Um, whether it was affecting you guys more because you were from out, you know, you're out of your country or what, but you yeah. you were both homesick. Did you just want to get your fight over and done with so you could just get back home? Yeah, it was a bit like that, do you know what I mean? Yeah. You could see the light at the end of the tunnel sort of thing, do you know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, it was, it was hard to stay focused. It was, uh, it was like, the closer you got to the end, the harder it was. You know, and you were just counting down the days. Well, next week, of course, we've got episode 11 and we've got the first female semi-final between Julia Penner and Sarah Morass. So we'll be back next week to break break that down. Thank you very much for coming yep. on and breaking down this week's episode. Yeah, no problem there. Uh, and if, before we let you go, as always, you want to do any shout-outs, friends, family, sponsors? I know you've got a lot of people behind you. Yeah, if I just give a big shout-out to all my friends and family, you know they are. And my sponsors, uh, Jeff Dobson, Mark E. Hire, Grant's Jim, Bad Boy, um, the Bill Tong man and, uh, and all, the, all the lads from all the gyms I train at they all know who they are cheers brilliant well, we'll be back again with you next week and we'll break down we've only got two episodes to go then we'll break down episode 11 next week thank you very much yeah that's excellent no problem there thanks I'm now joined by UFC middleweight Luke Barnett Luke is fresh off of a fight of the night performance and win at UFC in Manchester over Andrew Craig uh, obviously a very highly ranked opponent and in his own words, two knockouts and a submission in the same fight. Luke, thank you for joining us. Yeah, how are you doing, mate? You all right? Yeah, I'm very well, thank you. Wow, what, what a fight. Congratulations. Yeah, like you said, um, two knockouts and a submission in one fight is not bad, not bad at all. So what what was it like fighting in, in front of the Manchester crowd? Loud, um, very loud. A lot, a lot louder than I anticipated, to be honest. Um, Obviously, I fought over in Vegas uh, last time in front of an American crowd. It wasn't as uh, as busy. I think it was about uh, 11,000 people. I think it was about 14,000 this time. But, you know, the, the sound generated, the noise generated on my walkout was was intense. And it was crazy. And I remember in between rounds, you know, amping up the crowd and the response I got was, was insane. So... Um, yeah, they're very, very loud, and I can definitely tell the difference between fighting in England and fighting in the States. Everyone 
haven't spoke to me about it or oh, how you feel when I was like well I don't really know until I've done it um, but it was definitely uplifting yeah, the UK, I mean, I've been to a lot of UK UFC events. The UK fans get behind every single UK fighter. Uh, and when you obviously do what like what you did with with the nature of your result and the nature of your win, they just it just fires the crowd, doesn't it? It's so exciting. Yeah, they, they, they definitely did get behind me and, and a few of the other guys. And I'm like, you know, I, I, was, I didn't get to leave backstage afterwards, which I was a bit upset about. I didn't get to go out and sit with the fans and watch the rest of the fights. But backstage, I could hear them. You know, you could hear them all stomping their feet and shouting like crazy. And you know, it's it's it's, it's insane, really, when you have that experience. You know, when I walk out and I've got, like I said, fourteen, fifteen thousand people cheering for you, it's, uh, it's definitely a first for me. What was the fight week like at the hotel as well? Because I know, uh, again, from experience in that, from the fan point of view, uh, the the fans are there. They love to meet the fighters. Uh, what what did you enjoy that side to it? Yeah, there was some, there was some very very dedicated fans. Um, you know, some guys that camped out all week uh, to see see people. They were down in reception from eight o'clock in the morning till ten o'clock at night. You know, uh, just hoping to, to spot set people and meet people. You know, so we got to meet quite a lot of fans and do some pictures and, and chat. You know, chat generally just have a chat for a little while to the guys and everyone was so supportive and and you know. It was, it was good, great. I mean, my work leading up to the fight was very relaxing. I always try to keep it relaxed. I don't train whatsoever. Um, you see a lot of the guys nipping to the training room and, and getting a sweat on and moving around. But I just try and relax and, and enjoy myself. And you know, it was, it was a great week for me in Manchester. I've never been there before, so you know, I got to explore the city a little bit and, and experience it. It was great. Yeah, I can imagine it would be, it'd be good. Uh, let, let's talk a little bit about the fight then. I mean, it started off. It was. It was. You know, pretty even. It was clear you had, had the reach advantage, but I think everyone knew that going in. And then you've caught him with a big punch and dropped him. How close to you, did you finish? Uh, did you feel you were to finishing the fight? Um, I mean, in the first round, but, uh, the only thing of the fight, obviously, I was just trying to establish myself. But, um, it's uh, it's it's tough because you never know what the guy's going to do. You know, especially Andrew Craig. He's known for being a bit of a banger and hitting quite hard. But we knew going into the fight that obviously, like you said, I've got a bit of a rich advantage. I'm quite an awkward guy to fight. I really expected him to, to look for a takedown um, and surprise everyone. But he didn't. He came out and he tried to strike. Um, I've been working a lot with my um, with my boxing coach, Steve Whitwell, Whit Whit over at St. Ives, and trying to work, you know, drawing my opponent into my strikes rather than going. Because in my last fight, I went out and I searched for a knockout, you know. Um, I went at Colin Hart real hard and I hit him 120 odd times or whatever um, but I, I never got that timing down and I really like pushed it rather than waiting and, and letting him come to me so you know for the first couple of minutes I was just trying to get comfortable and establish my position in the cage uh, make him work off me rather than the other way around and then like you said uh, he, set, he, he worked perfectly I set my jab up and he was struggling to get in and then when he did overcommit and step in, I caught him with a, with a straight right, pretty flush. Um, but he was still there. You know, I knew... Uh, I, I, there's a bit of a hazy point with this where people have been accused of celebrating. I, in the, third, the first round when I knocked him down, there was no celebration. Um, I dropped him. I knew he was going to come back because I'd studied his tape and I knew that he, uh, yeah, he, he could fight through those sort of situations. And... I, I, I put my hand in the air to throw it down with more force. It's something I'm going to do with my ground and pound uh, drill with one of my coaches. You know, so my right hand goes into the air, not celebrating. Uh, it, was, it was to create more force on my downward strike. But rather than Andrew falling to his back and falling flat on his back for me to hit him, into, you know, I expect I'd manage to hit him and go into the guard, he actually came forward um, and tried to, tried to reshoot and grab my leg. So as I threw the shot, it hit him in the shoulder. Uh, but yeah, no, and then I established a half decent position, spooled him out, and then you know, kept hitting him with shots. So I think I hit him there quite a 15, 16 times and then caused some damage. And I think that's where the real damage was in the fight, to be honest. Uh, and then we come back to the feet and, and we see the round out. So a bit of confusion there, but I, I didn't think he was finished at all in, at that point. You know, I knew I had to keep going, and I was looking to establish a dominant position on the ground and, and, and get the TKO victory at that point of the fight, you know. Obviously, round two come out, and it's pretty much the same as round one, really. I mean, again, he was struggling to get inside. 
Uh, you caught him with another another big punch, but this time you did manage to pounce, uh, and you, and you you know you got and you got the the rear naked choke finish. Talk us through the uh, the end of the fight. Yeah, I mean, um, I think he was definitely shaken after the first round, and, and sort of worried is, is the word I'd use. It was like he was thinking, God, what am I going to do? You know. Um, I spoke to Andrew after the fight and he said coming into the second round he, he could see two of me he was still dizzy from the first round um, so you know he, he wasn't in, in the shape but I, I stepped up a bit started adding a bit more pace to my shots and moving a bit more and obviously I got a lot more confident from dropping him in the first round so I was really looking for the kill um, I remember he throws up a front kick at me and I feel the wind hit me in the face you know and then he foot comes down and I, I hit him with a nice right hand and, and from then I just I felt that I was looking for the kill um, and he came in and overcome it to his shot and I grabbed him in a tight clinch and hit him with a, a quick uppercut uh, which managed to drop him and then the two punches I've been working really really hard for this fight with if I've got him at range I hit him with a straight right if he comes close to me I'm either going to hit him with an uppercut or a knee um, and it worked perfectly uh, I, this time I did make the mistake and celebrate. Um, I, I, I had him in my hand, you know, in the clinch. had hold of his head, had hold of his shoulder, and I hit him with that right hand. And I just felt his whole body go limp um, and fall over. So I was like, he's out. I really thought he was completely unconscious and he was going to be down for a while. And I, um, you know, I, I looked for the showboat that's finished and started to walk off. And as I did that, he was nipping at my heels and managed to get back to his feet. Um, you know, so that's why I decided that he was a bit wobbly. He grabbed hold of me, and I felt he was weak when he grabbed me because obviously he was rocked. Um, so I decided to take it to the ground. Uh, I was looking for a ground and pound finish, really, but he uh, he scrambled, and I managed to get on his back and get the choke. So I, I'm quite happy with that, and proud that I got to. You know, even though it was a mistake with the celebration, I got to show that I've got takedowns in my bag. You know, and I've also got some good jujitsu, um, some good transitional jujitsu that. Uh, People don't really know me for. I'm, I'm getting more known as a striker now and, and a stand-up fighter. Uh, because my early, early on in my career, I was I was all jiu-jitsu, so it was nice to show that part of my game as well. Yeah, I mean, obviously, on the Ultimate Fighter, you, you, of course, you won fight of the season, and uh, this time you won fight of the night. What was it like to pick up your first UFC bonus outside of the Ultimate Fighter? Yeah, I mean, so if you counted uh, the Landry's fight as a UFC fight, which obviously it doesn't, but if we did. You know, that would, that would have been, I would have thought I had that fight, then I fought Colin Hart, and then I had this fight. So, in my last three performances, I've had fight of the night performances uh, out of two of them, you know, which isn't bad. Um, so, I, I personally believe the Colin Hart fight was the most exciting out of all three, um, which is the one I didn't get a bonus for. You know, the pace we set in that fight, me and Colin, was insane. You know, for middleweights, like I said, he, I hit him 129 times, he hit me 97 back and forth, back and forth, back and forth for 15 minutes and we never stopped. Um, I think I lost the bonus out to two women that night who definitely deserved it, the Catherine Garner and Misha Tate fight. Um, but I think that was a fight that I performed as well. So hopefully the UFC fans and the guys that watch the UFC realise that I'm a, you know, I'm a fighter that's going to produce fight that I performances and exciting fights. Um, but to get the actual bonus this time around, I really didn't expect it. Um, I hadn't even spoken about it, you know, backstage with my coaches after the fight, we were just so happy that I'd won and we never it never even really came up. And then I was sitting at the post press conference and uh, Dana said, Oh, and fight the night goes to Barnett and Craig and and I, and I was so I didn't even know it was coming. So, so that was the first was time you actually heard then? That was the first time I heard about it, yeah. That was oh, the wow. time I, I knew I got the bonus for the city sitting on the table and I had to look cool and calm. I couldn't get up and scream <laughs> or anything. So I think I just gave it a little bit of a fist bump and that, yeah. and that was it. Um but yeah, it was a, uh, it was great, and you know, it's a, it's a big deal for me because it allows me now to to move forward with with my finances and, and really be able to reinvest a lot of money into my career. Because fight on fight, we don't earn enough money really to to, to train how we should, you know, a hundred percent. But now with this bonus behind me, it gives me some capital in the bank to to really invest in my career. And, and you know, with that win, I'm I'm going to be fighting some monsters pretty soon. So I need to make sure that I'm prepared for them and, uh, and that money's going to help me do it. Talking about fighting some monsters, of course, me and you had spoke previously about a list of opponents and we'd mentioned a few different names. Uh, you know, I'll throw some of the names out there. Chris Camozzi, Francis Carmont, uh, Magnus Seed and Blad. 
But I mean, I think personally, after that win, uh, maybe apart from Francis Carmont, but I think you move above the other opponents now. I mean, Francis Carmont's still pretty highly ranked. He's coming off a big win over Filippo, so that'd be a good matchup. But I don't know. I don't know how, if you agree or not. But I think Camozzi and uh, Magnus Seidenberg would be a bit of a step down from Andrew Craig. Do you agree? Um, well, <laughs> Camelbad definitely. I think Magnus is, um, would be a step down. But right now, it's not really about that for me in my career. It's about getting the fights in and getting the wins in. You know, uh, I, I, I want to move towards the title, and that's what I want to do. Uh, Francis Carmont's ranked eighth in the world. You know, so he's probably a little bit out of my reach at the moment. I think I need one more win or two more wins before I'm, I'm, a, I'm a, eligible for that fight. Um, because of his win over Costa for the boot. But I think, I think the one that sticks out is Chris Camozzi. Um, he, if you look at the world rankings right now, uh, Andrew Craig is ranked 21st in the UFC uh, when I beat him. Uh, so I was ranked 52nd. So it's one of the biggest jumps in, in, uh, in rankings that the UFC has probably ever seen because they don't usually match people up like that. So I've managed to go from 52nd. I'm, I'm now ranked 24th. Uh, in the UFC uh, in the middleweight division I believe Chris Camozzi is ranked 22nd 23rd around that you know he might be a little bit higher a little bit lower um, so we're very very close together but having said that he fights on Wednesday um, against Lorenz Larkin so it really depends on that outcome I believe Chris Camozzi wins that fight me and him just makes absolute sense you know we, we fought a week apart or two weeks apart or a week and a half I think it is apart um you know, we were both ranked relatively close. Um, and, you know, it's, it's just a great matchup. But, um, again, he's a, he's a tall striker, and I'm a tall striker, and we both like to fight for the fans. I know Kamoji's put in some great performances. So I think um, I think that's just the fight that makes sense right now. Uh, but, you know, and he can lose. If he loses, he'll be off the picture because they, do, uh, they don't do winners versus losers. But um, I don't know. I really don't know at the moment. I'm, I'm just looking at the whole division, see how it moves, and, and I'd love to, to fight as soon as possible, you know. The one name that gets stuck to me every now and then is, uh, what I actually said in, in my post-fight interview, was Dylan Andrews, um, he obviously the guy I lost to on the Ultimate Fighter. Um, I'd love to fight Dylan, Dylan again, and Dylan has done well since he left the house. He hasn't fought people as highly ranked as I have, but he's got some solid wins. Um, so, you know, that's a fight I would definitely look look, look at taking. I, you know, me and Dylan are pretty close. I think he's a great guy, but you know, he, at the end of the day, it's a, a, a loss. I want a revenge. Um, but yeah, I, I'm just, I'm just waiting. You know, I'm just laying in wait to find out what happens. But Chris Camozzi is definitely, uh, definitely the name on the top of my list at the moment. I think it makes sense. Uh, I think we have a great fight, and I think the fans would want to watch it. And you know, I'd like to fight in America maybe, and I think Camozzi uh, suits that as well. It's funny you've mentioned that. Uh, you should mention that about Dylan Andrews because, of course, he's got a fight coming up soon as well. And he's fighting another tough uh, 17 contestant. He's fighting Clint Hester. How do you see that fight playing out? I mean, that's a fantastic fight. Um, I actually sent, said to Clint, if he didn't feel that well, I'd, I'd take his place. Mm. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I'd pay him. He could take my purse and I'd fight the Landry for free. Uh, but, you know, I, I think that this fight could go either way. It's, it, Clint is an absolute monster. You know, Clint's a great guy as well. And he, I know he trains very, very hard. Um, as all the guys do, but Clint is one of those guys that's got endless potential. He's a bit raw in the house, um, you know, very early on in his career, and he, he you know, he come from a boxing stand-up background. I know Dylan is more of a stand-up guy. It's very interesting because they've trained together for eight weeks. They're very close, you know. It's, a, it's something that it's hard to give you a point of uh, opinion on. I, I think Dylan comes across as the winner in my eyes I think he's a little bit more well rounded at these, this point um, I think on the feet he's got more power in his hands uh, which obviously I'm on the, I've come on the, the bad end of and so is Jimmy Quinlan and so is Papi Abidi um, you know his last fight if you watch Dylan's last fight he's actually getting dominated for, for two and a half rounds and then he hits Papi Abidi with a tiny uppercut a real short uppercut and knocks him out um, so he can finish a fight at any moment but so can Clint Hester. So, I don't know. I, I, it's an interesting one. I, th I think Dylan Andrews has the experience and I think he'll he'll fare up better in the fight. Uh, but I, I'm just a fan in that fight. I'm just looking forward to watching it. Yeah, I think it's going to be a great fight. Now, you mentioned there about fighting in America. Would you like to fight on the card at London? The the rumoured, well, not the rumour, it's been confirmed that the Wembley card in March, would that be an option for you? 
definitely an option. Um, you know, I, I, I like fighting in England. I love fighting in Manchester. Um, March 8th suits perfectly time-wise. It's about 15 weeks away, 16 weeks away. So I get a full training camp in and all that sort of stuff. Um, it's just that there's a, there might be an opportunity for me uh, taking part in Tough Brazil uh, with Chael going on as well as one of, one of his assistant coaches. Um, so that that would be at the same time frame that's getting recorded. So I wouldn't be able to, I, I wouldn't want to pop, pass up the opportunity of Tough Brazil as an assistant, you know, going to Rio and then experiencing that to fight on the London card. Um, but, you know, I, I like to fight in England. I know that card's going to be a monster card because I know Gustafsson's um, fighting on it. He's the headliner. And I know that Ross Pearson and Melvin Gallard are going to have a rematch. So it's definitely going to be a big card. Uh, but I just don't want to become one of these fighters that's just not stuck is the wrong word, but I only fight in England. You know, I want to travel. I think it's one of the biggest biggest pluses of fighting in the UFC. Um, and I want to fight. I want to fight, you know, the, the best guys. And right now, the best guys are American. You know, American and Brazilian above me. If you look at the rankings, most of them are American guys. Um, and I can't keep expecting Americans to fly over to England for me. So, you know, I want to I want to fight the best guys and I want to fight on the biggest the bigger shows. I want to fight, you know, the, the, the show I'd love to fight on is February 1st, uh, which is Super Bowl weekend. You know, they've got the two, to, the two total fights on that card. On the undercard of that would be a great experience. But, you know, I'll do what I'm told. And when the UFC let me know where, where I'm fighting, I'll, I'll fight anywhere. I'll fly anywhere and fight anyone. So it doesn't really matter. Uh, but I can I, I imagine they're going to want me on the London card, uh, especially after the performance I've on in Manchester. I imagine they would as well. I think I could see you being the uh, third fight behind the main event of Gustafsson and the co-main event of Pearson Gillard. That's you know after just going on what we saw and the reaction you got and the nature nature of it wasn't just the win, but it was the nature of the win. You mentioned there about tough Brazil. Do you want, can you tell us a little bit more about that? Um, you know, it's, there's nothing confirmed, nothing happening. Like, you know, it's just that me and obviously Carol was over for my fight. Um, we sat down over dinner and spoke about it, and he asked if, uh, you know, we, we'd spoken about it before. I, we had, like, I, I sent him like a cheeky text about six months ago or five months ago, saying, if you ever coach the Armour Fire again, I'm definitely going to be one of your coaches. And he takes me back saying, you know, you're the first person I'd think of or the first person I'd ask or something like that. And I was like, all right, cool. Um, and then he did get offered the tough, the tough Brazil thing, and we spoke about it over dinner. Uh, and it's definitely something that that Charles interested in having me there, and I'm interested in going there. But we have to jump the hurdles and, and see what the UFC want because I know it's going to be Chael coaching Brazilians uh, in Brazil. So I think most of his coaching staff need to be able to speak Portuguese, and uh, it's, it's a skill I don't possess at the moment. Uh, although I'm thinking about taking it up. And trying to learn Portuguese, not for the armor fighter, just in general. I think it'll be a good, a good stance business-wise. You know, when you look at the UFC, forty uh, percent of the market is Brazilian now. They're doing thirteen or sixteen shows next year in Brazil. Uh, so you know, my marketability will double if I if I can speak Portuguese and I can go to a Portuguese country and talk to their media as well as my own. So that's something I'm thinking about trying to learn that language. And I think if I get put on tough Brazil, I'll definitely do it. Um, but yeah, it's, it's just it's, it's just an idea at the moment. I don't think Chael even he's only known he's that he's been doing it for a couple of weeks and he's getting his head around it. So I think after after the Rashad fight next Saturday or the 16th, um, me and Chael will sit down again and, and work out if it's if it's a possibility. Is it Brazilians versus Brazilians then, or I, I thought I'd heard rumours of it being USA versus Brazil, or is that not true? It's well as it stands, it's tough Brazil. Uh, Tough Brazil is Brazilian versus Brazilian, you know. Um, yeah. People have been rumored, like Vanderlei came out and said, you find your best Americans and I'll put them against the best, my best in Brazil. You know, but as it stands, it's tough Brazil. Brazil versus Brazil. Um, him coaching Brazilians, like I said, he's been asked to get Portuguese staff. So uh, it's getting filmed in Brazil by Brazilians. You know, it's uh, it's not you know it's not a normal team that, that film in Vegas. It's, it's an outlet of the show shown in Brazil, I'm sure they'll show it in America as well, but it's not getting produced by uh, Tough Pine Productions, who did do the US version. Um, you know, they're talking about doing a UK one, and if it was a, if we had Tough UK, it would be UK versus UK, it wouldn't be a UK versus USA or UK versus Australia, that's like a different format. Yeah. Tough Brazil is just for the Brazilians, so um, as it stands, he's, he's going to be coaching Brazilian guys, but 
you know, I struggle to see how that's going to work, but we'll, we'll, we'll have to find out. Well, you've certainly got a lot going on at the minute. I mean, it's it sounds like such a, a crazy time. I mean, if you think back, really, over the last 12 months, your life's changed a lot, hasn't it, in the last 12 months? Yeah, I mean, uh, about a week ago, a year ago, um, I was trying out to fight to get in the armour fighter, uh, you know, to, to be a part of the show. I had the opportunity to fight to get in the house. That was October 28th, I think, I threw out, because I remember getting to Vegas and it being zom- zombie season and everyone was walking around dressed as zombies, so... It was Halloween. Um, so yeah, in 12 months, you can see how someone's career could change. But I've been, you know, I've been putting work in for the last five years for this to happen. I committed my whole life to it. I, um, I, you know, gave up my job and, and took a lot of big risks, and they're finally starting to pay off. Uh, and I don't, I don't, you know, it may seem like a whirlwind to, to, from the outside and a lot going on and a lot happening. But if you live the day-to-day life that I live every day, training two to three times a day, and then. About the UFC, you know, it's just the beginning for me. I've not not done anything yet. I've not scratched the surface on what I want to do uh, in the company, and, and I've got big plans. And, and they they're going to you know keep growing. And I think if we look at 12, 12 months again, we'll see where I go. So twelve months is a long time in the UFC. I could have four fights and be fighting for a title when you think of it that way. So it's uh, it happens that quickly. Well, you're certainly going in the right direction. I really appreciate you coming on and giving me your time today, Luke. It's been a pleasure getting you back on the show. No problem, Ray. It's always good to come on. I'm a bit hard to get hold of, but, but when you get me out, I'm happy to give the time up. Uh, well, before we let you go then, Luke, do you want to give you a chance to do any shout-outs? Do you want to thank any, uh, thank any friends, family, sponsors, and let people know about your Facebook and your Twitter? Um, yeah, I mean, I want to thank mainly my, uh, my management, uh, which is DeNovo, uh, DeNovo Athlete Management. You can follow them on Twitter as well, at DeNovo. Um, and my, obviously my gym, the Tsunami Gym, Robbie Olivier, John McGuire, Jack Mason, all the guys there. Uh, Medieval, which is one of my big sponsors, um, that helped me out quite a lot. Uh, it's, uh, it gets fun enough, so check it out. I use it all the time. And that's it, really. And I know, obviously, there's, there's loads of people to thank, but I don't like banging on about it. Just mainly my management and my team are, are the big ones. So uh, if you want to check me out, go on to go on to Twitter. I'm at Luke Barnett, B A R N A W T. Um, I'm huge on Twitter. I'm on there every day, t- uh, tweeting competitions, giving away free stuff. Uh, so get involved. Cool. Well, thank you very much for your time, Luke. It's been really nice getting you back on the show. Cheers, man, mate. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed listening to those interviews. We had some good guests on this week. So uh, book for next week. I'm I'm always working on new guests, but definitely uh, back on for next week. We've got David Grant uh, to break down episode 11 of Tough 18, uh, which will be the first female semi-final between Juliana Penner and Sarah Morass. Uh, Also, performance potential with Dave Bond will be back after a week's rest. We will have another whistle-stop tour of UK MMA in our weekly segment UK MMA with Your MMA, hosted by Jay Furness. And we also start our build-up to XFC 27, Frozen Fury, which is on December 13th in Muskegon, Michigan. Uh, And this week we're speaking to Dominic Steele uh, and Dequan Townsend. So please make sure you don't miss that that show. Thank you.